Hey guys, Abe here from Overcast Gamer and a very merry new year to you all. We're just about to kick off season three of the Overcast Gamer show and we have some pretty exciting news. We've actually received our first sponsor for the podcast. That is The Book Guys. So you've heard of Audible probably on a lot of podcasts you listened to previously. And these guys are similar, but they actually sell secondhand audio books. When you chuck on the MP3, it sort of kicks off where the last person left off. Now, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on uh, maybe maybe you've heard the intro of the book is actually terrible and you don't want to waste your time with it. Pick up a secondhand audio book and you don't have to deal with that crap. So you can actually head to thebookguys.co.nz, use our promo code STINGY for 2% off your first secondhand audio book. That's thebookguys.co.nz and use the promo code STINGY. Good evening and welcome to the Overcast Gamer Show, the very beginning of Season 3. It is February the 20th, 2018. My name is Regan Harper and... In what almost feels like we've got an old friend, well, we do have an old friend back, but almost like a almost like a guest appearance, given the the time that he's been away. Introducing Abe Foster. It's me. I'm back. I'm back from overseas, from the uh, the cold shores of continental Europe. It's pretty bizarre being back in what can only be described as a sort of a clusterfuck of a jungle temperature, really, in New Zealand, going on here at the moment. It's. Uh, it's 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 quite obscene. It it's been awful. Uh, but before we dive too far into it, also joining us this evening is that's uh, Valentine. No mm. no intro needed. Don't worry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say your name, and I thought like yeah, yeah, you're like you're just here. You've been here the whole time, so mm. you know. In between podcasts, I just power down. <laughs> I only exist when I'm being observed. Yeah, we put him in the, put him in the corner. Um, he gathers a little bit of dust, and then we power him up for each podcast. Um, <laughs> so, hey, welcome back, man. How, so Thank you very much. You've been away in Europe, and we've we've had a little bit of time before we've sort of kicked back up into to doing our first podcast of Season 3. Yep. Tell, tell us about it, man. Man, I just uh, sort of just wung my way through Europe with no particular plan. I went to a few uh, sort of the... the the idea of going to uh, to Europe spawned from following one of my favourite bands throughout uh, continental Europe. I'd also never been to continental Europe. I'd been to the UK before and sort of uh, Republic of Ireland, but I'd never been off onto the continent. So I decided to, mm. to give that a whirl. Uh, started in Amsterdam, which is a absolutely wonderful city, though <laughs> incredibly dangerous. Really? They have the oh ninjas on bikes, man everywhere there's just <laughs> you just, walk anywhere and you almost get hit by a bike i swear it's quite terrifying interesting because my experience of danger in the street here in new zealand i suppose is, is general traffic and you would think yeah that, hey like the bikes are the least of your worries but not so in amsterdam it would sound same well in amsterdam they're so a they're bikes so you can't you can't really hear them coming um <laughs> and b bicycle lanes just take take precedent over every other sort of automobile in the city so you you'll get halfway through what looks like a pedestrian crossing there'll be a bloody bicycle lane in the middle of it so you got to watch your damn step otherwise you get mowed down halfway through a pedestrian crossing so the bikes don't need to stop for pedestrians the bikes do not stop for anyone <laughs> <laughs> that's the rule of thumb that's what you should know when you go to Amsterdam is bicyclists are the top of the food chain i believe there's a law that if a bike and a car collide the car will they'll have to pay reparations every time wow it doesn't matter what the situation was it's just yeah bicycles uh they have it well there you go there you go amsterdam yeah. is a good good hot travel tip so amsterdam on to where from amsterdam i traveled south and went into belgium uh, to a little city. No, it's not really a city. It's a town. It's a town called Bruges, which you might recognise from the movie In Bruges, which is a great uh, with film. Colin Farrell and um, Brendan Gleeson. It is a great film. It's one of my favourite films, in fact, and the exact reason why I wanted to go to Bruges, <laughs> just to say I was in Bruges, <laughs> yeah. had been in Bruges, 
and uh, and you know various variations on that. But absolutely loved Bruges. I happened to be there during Christmas time uh, with a friend, and we just sort of wandered the Christmas markets and looked for the best deal on mulled wine and got absolutely tanked. It was great. <laughs> awesome. But uh, Belgium is a is a wonderful place. They they pride themselves on being purveyors of chocolate and beer. And I mean, that's just a good combination of things. That is right pretty there. cool, eh? To sort of like carve out your national identity based around those particular two kind of foods. That's so <laughs> good. It's it's the most hedonist. Like it's that and Amsterdam are two of the most hedonistic places I've ever been, and oh, it's I bet. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So Bruges for Christmas, there for, for a li- Christmas. little while, and then on to from somewhere from there. Uh, yeah, so back into the Netherlands at that point, parted ways with my mate, and I I sort of continued north and stayed a few places in the Netherlands. Uh, one place I stayed, which I'll, I'll give a shout out, even though it was a shithole, the hostel, <laughs> Bud Get Hostels. Now, you know, if you were me, you assume that is a typo, or it had a space in between Bud Get. I was like, oh, budget hostel, right, okay. They, and I looked at the business card and I looked at all the branding and no, this is it's called Bud Get Hostels. <laughs> um, so that should have been a that should have been a warning to me, but I, I you know was a bit bit careless with that. Uh, stayed that place and the first thing I that happened when I sort of went into my room uh, was the only other person in there was sort of I would say late thirties kind of lady asked me for money. <laughs> so. Interesting. Straight away, that's the first thing that happened. Uh, she <laughs> asked me for money for, I quote, a drink. It was also freezing in that room. It was winter, so it was freezing everywhere. But it was particularly freezing in that room. It did have a heat pump, but you had to pay ten euros for the remote. <laughs> so uh, that was a that was a bit cheeky, to be honest. The old bud get really squeezing out, out every sort of penny from the this the travellers. It sounds to me oh, kind of like the Ryanair slash Jetstar of of pretty much, man. I don't think. I think it can't be a chain because I can't imagine they'd do that well if all their reviews are just, I got solicited for money by my roommate and it was minus 20 degrees in my room. But yeah, that was an interesting sort of turn of events. From there, I ended. I, I went into Germany. I stayed in a place called Bremen the first night and that was all well and good. I had a roommate who was a Russian fella uh, who was, oh no, sorry, he spoke Russian. He was born in Slovakia and he was living in Belgium. Um, so quite the <laughs> eclectic mix of things. Uh, he didn't. He, he spoke very minimal English, like a few words. So we ended up having a conversation purely through translation apps on our phones, nice. which was quite something. Intensely, like m- mentally draining, but a lot of fun. So that that's something I'll I'll definitely never forget is uh, having a chat with old Alex about uh, Winston Churchill in the early hours of the morning via <laughs> this like text-to-speech program on my phone. <laughs> Amazing. The only, you know, it's the kind of thing that would only ever happen on a on a, an excursion like that. That's great. Yeah, yeah, completely bizarre. That's why I love just having no plan and just winging it because you get yourself into these weird situations like that and especially staying in hostels. You never know who you're going to encounter, eh? Um, mm. Most of the time, if they're even if they're a little bit weird, you know that makes for a good story and uh, and an even better memory. Uh, I then went to Hamburg, um, which was sort of where the second gig was. So that was where I was making my way to from Amsterdam, um, just stopping off at various places along the along the show. I uh, didn't see too much of Hamburg. I was only there for like one night and one uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, probably like a night, and then I left about mid morning the next morning. Um, so didn't see too much, but I enjoyed it. Went out and got some more mulled wine. Sort of became a wee bit of an alcoholic on this trip, but purely for mulled wine. <laughs> I'm just a selective alcoholic. That totally yeah. fits the bill, though. You know, Europe in the middle yeah. of winter, you want something like that. Like, you're not going to go oh. out and get a nice cold beer, are you? No, oh, it's it's the nectar of the gods is mulled wine, <laughs> Regan. It's the nectar of the gods. I, um... Uh, I've been craving it. I mean, that's probably the sign of an alcoholic, to be honest, but I've been craving its warmth, its warm embrace. Uh, even in the temperatures we're having, you know, 27 degrees some days, blooming hell. Yeah, from there I went to Copenhagen. Uh, the next morning I was actually in Copenhagen, and it's quite something being in one country one night and another country the very next. 
uh, it's, a, it's a very strange feeling, in fact. Not at all something that we're used to as New Zealanders, right? Being no. so isolated. It's just, it's a very foreign idea that... Yeah, it's bizarre. Every, you know, everyone could be speaking a completely different language, which they were. Um, there was a few German speakers in, in Denmark, but not many, mostly, you know, Danish, as, as, as would be expected. And Copenhagen was sort of like... It was a really cool place, but it was super expensive. Um, so a lot of their money is coin-based, and the coins are actually, if you do the exchange, you can get sort of three coins is worth about six bucks, six to nine bucks. So you sort of start spending the coins as if they're small change, but they're not. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're spending like 10 bucks on a coffee <laughs> without even realizing it. So, yeah, I only stayed there like a couple of nights because that would have milked me dry, um, old Copenhagen. But that was where the final gig was. So I had a blast there, uh, met some really lovely people, uh, a Swedish fella and a um, uh, Slovakian lady. And, yeah, had an absolute blast. And then the rest, I, I ended up back in London, uh, visited some friends uh, from Wellington, actually, who have moved over to London recently. And then sort of um, visited some friends in Edinburgh as well, and then explored the highlands of Scotland for probably a week or something like that. Went up to the Orkney Islands, which is somewhere I never in a million years imagined I'd get to. Are they the place? Are they because I, I, the Orkney Islands ring a bell to me, and I feel like it's because they've got like wind turbines there or something. Is that does that mean anything to you? If I say wind turbines, they, yeah. Though they do, they definitely do. Oh, Scotland's actually really good on that front. Scotland has a has a hard on for renewable energy, not as much as the <laughs> Netherlands. The Netherlands has like a rager for renewable energy. It's quite good. It's, it's, you know, it's really good. They're leading yeah. the way. Yeah. But um, no, Scotland definitely has loads of wind turbines as well and geothermic um, plants as well. But yeah, no, Orkneys Orkneys definitely have those, and they're just it's just a it's just a whole nother world, eh? You know, there's a population of about 10,000, I think, on the Orkney Islands. Yeah. Um, there's about nine to ten islands in general, uh, one sort of main one. But, yeah, I ended up having New Year's there uh, with a, a lovely bunch of people uh, with whom I couch surfed and um, went and watched a Orkney Island tradition called The Bar in which a bunch of dudes sort of – everyone goes into the centre of town, um, you know, everyone from the near vicinity – on New Year's Day, and it's sort of like the genesis of rugby. Well, that's what it felt like to me. It's it's a whole bunch of dudes in in rugby gear, and they have a sort of spherical ball, and it's just this giant scrum that just goes through <laughs> the streets. It's like an urban scrum. It's bizarre. They smash into shop fronts, and God help you if you get in the way of them. You'll prob you'll you know you could get trampled to death quite easily. So we watched that for about four hours, and it's quite something. The, these dudes are so <laughs> tightly packed in. And they're moving with such gusto that actual steam starts coming off human bodies, which I'd never seen before. And what are they um, trying to achieve? So one one side is there's the the uppies and the doonies, as they call them, <laughs> and the uppies are trying to get uh, a ball. You know, they're trying to get the ball or the bar uh, to one side of the town, and the doonies are trying to get it to the other. Uh, the doonies, I believe, are trying to get it into the harbour. And the uppies are just trying to get it to a specific piece of wall um, in the uptown. So, it's it's a it's pretty damn cool. It's just something I, I I was just like, where? What time period am I in right now? Yeah, that's <laughs> bizarre. And they do that one, like an, once a year. Uh, twice a year, actually. They do it on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So I, I managed to see the the New Year's Day one. Huh. Um, that was that was pretty damn pretty damn fantastic, to be honest, man. And then uh, yeah, from there, just sort of. Hung around Edinburgh. Um, I flew to the Czech Republic. Uh, caught up with a few few friends in the Czech Republic who I hadn't seen in probably about five or six years. I met them when I was housekeeping in Canada back in t- 2012 when I moved over there for a year. Cool. Um, so that was pretty awesome, reuniting with the, with those guys. And uh, then I ended up going through Austria uh, into Vienna and into uh, Budapest as my last sort of place on the continent. Um, and Budapest, I, I'm, I actually went into a hostel. Uh, there was no one else there at the time I checked in. So I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Um, then two, two young Aussie fellas uh, came along and we all, we all got along famously. Uh, we ended up having beers in the thermal baths in the middle of the snow <laughs> in a park. Uh, so, yeah, just absolutely fantastic times. Um, yeah, not, not much after that, man. I just went back to Edinburgh, 
um, bummed around for you know another week before I went home, and um, and now I'm back. Now you're back. That dude, back. That, that sounds absolutely amazing. And uh, thank you for the sort of blow by blow account. <laughs> with with that, I'm going to officially hand the mantle of OCG kind of podcast uh, host back over to you. So there you go. All right, uh, no tr- worries. Yeah, treat it well. There you are. <laughs> happy, <laughs> happy to happy to take the reins back, Regan. So, yeah, happy happy New Year, Merry Christmas, <laughs> and uh, welcome back to the Over- Overcast Gamer Show, everyone. This is season three. We've been going for three bloody years, fellas. That is quite insane. Think about that's yeah, that's weird. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether I want to think about it or not. <laughs> Time <laughs> is just slipping through our fingers. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's cool. Three years, season three. Um, yeah. And we've got some cool stuff, I think, planned for this year. We do. We've actually been stepping up our content game. We've been putting out news stories. We've been putting out fake news stories. And we've been putting out, uh, you know, just little little snippets here and there on the on the old website. So feel free to check that out, overcastgamer.com, of course. And, um, yeah, we're hoping to get some kick into more video production, I think, is, is a big thing uh, for this year. So definitely look out for that as well. Uh, before we move into what we've been playing, fellas, Anything that of note, uh, or any good stories that you guys want from the past, you know, few months? Shit, nothing really, to be honest. Nothing. Like you've just told this massive story about <laughs> Europe, and and you know, what's been going on in my life is more or less to be expected. You know, uh, we had a break, we had summer. Yep. I've been painting our house, uh, which is essentially something that's been happening for a while. So did nothing, did nothing, <laughs> nothing really. Painting a that house, Greg, give me you've, something. You've been domesticized, big time, big time. <laughs> it it turns out that painting a house is probably not a one man job. I would say <laughs> no. Um, well, I've come, I've come to learn. So when I say painting a house, I haven't actually painted anything yet uh, because the last sort of, I suppose two months of of my time has just been in paint prep so evenings and on weekends just outside scraping at walls oh, with yes. sharp objects yep i remember doing this and yeah and sanding and priming so you know when i say painting i mean less painting and more <laughs> just fapping about so yeah that that sort of stuff very domestic and probably not at all the kind of thing that people would be excited to hear about in a podcast but uh, you've literally that's... been well no you haven't been watching paint dry but very close to watching paint dry you're in the... i'm one step away i'm genuinely one step you away you haven't even been watching paint dry <laughs> haven't got to that stage yeah <laughs> no, I'm excited for that step. Actually, um, that's 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 coming up. I can't wait to stand back and watch it do its thing. Yes. But no, no, nothing crazy. Balthazar, you must have something cooler than that, surely. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You're asking Good. me to recall months. I don't know. I don't even recall a day ago. I don't know what's going on. My life yeah. is like no, a that's... like a whiteboard. I just wipe it clean when I get up every morning, and I have no history. It's a very depressing <laughs> take on the Forrest Gump quote there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sure is, yeah. Well, we were saying before how we sort of just turn them off and just boot them up for each podcast. So <laughs> essentially, we're just wiping your RAM and, mm. you know, you kick off from, from, from word one. Yeah, nice. Refreshing, refreshing. Well, in that case, uh, I think we'll just move straight into some actual video game chat boys well i you know this is the first episode of season three we've got plenty of time for talking about pack and save specials and whatnot so so we'll just get into some actual video game content shall we i would like balthazar if you want to chat about what you've been playing man let me remember yeah i've actually been playing quite a lot but there's only really two standouts the biggest talking point would be monster hunter world a few reasons why it would be a big talking point a because uh, long-time listeners would know it's one I never intended on getting before the PC release. The reason for that being the PC release is obviously going to be the best when it does come out. But <laughs> I uh, have no free will, essentially. Um, <laughs> one one weekend, Hannah decided she wanted us to both get it and play it together. So I bought two copies and we've been playing it together. That to me sounds like it wouldn't have been a hard sell, to be fair. It wasn't. Like she would have just been like, what do, you, what do you think of this? She would have been, okay. Yeah. It's like right. when, 
It's, it's like when my girlfriend says, oh, I can't really be bothered cooking tonight. Can you? And I'm like, no. And then she's like, KFC? And I'm like, yes. You nice. Know, it's not, uh, yeah. mm, that it's was not tonight a difficult for pizza transaction. Nice. Um, <laughs> nice. So, yeah, it's been fun. I am kind of glad I didn't wait for the PC release. It very much feels like a game of the now kind of thing. Um, like a big thing about monster hunter is always hunting in in big groups kind of thing and yeah as you go on and your rank increases you start getting more and more things that only have a party size of two um which is great because we can just play those and know that we're playing at maximum party size with just the two of us but there's still a lot of big you know set piece moments and things that you want for four hunters for and so it's very much a game of play it now while everyone is playing it because yeah. if you wait until everyone's stopped you don't get the full experience and it also feels like the number of players across xbox and playstation it doesn't really feel like there's anyone left to play it on pc when it comes out like i don't know how many people are going to rebuy the game on pc when it's such a uh kind of re- like the game the game itself you can get rebuying a game later if you want to play it again because you know you enjoyed it when you played it and everything like that and you want to re-experience it from the beginning but the difference is with monster hunter you don't experience it once like the whole core gameplay loop of monster hunter is struggle to kill a monster use its parts to make stronger gear so that you can kill it faster to get more point parts to finish building the set of gear and then move on to the next monster so you've already fought every monster in the game like a hundred times before it comes out on pc so I don't know how many people are going to be get. It seems like the only people who play at PC will be people who haven't played it yet, but it really doesn't seem like that's many people. So I am I totally I'm glad understand, I've been playing I it I understand now. what you're saying with this, but I'm also a little bit disappointed because it was you who convinced me to not buy it on PlayStation because you were like, nah, it'd be better on PC. And I was like, and yeah, I stand no, by you're that. probably right. It will. It will be better <laughs> on PC. But I also, like... I think it's fine now on PlayStation. Um, I've realized from playing it that, you know, it's it's very surprising, I think, how much I'm enjoying it purely because it's a Capcom game and they don't necessarily have a history for incredible optimization. Um, but it runs incredibly well on the PS4, um, like standard non-pro PS4. The load times are a little bit up there, you know, a minute to get into something. But when you're in it you're in it for sort of 20 to 30 minutes so right. we're still only talking a couple of minutes an hour of loading so something and they could probably patch out as well potentially yeah and something that they could yeah they could always decide to release some updates that allow you to install a bunch of the data off the disk kind of thing and then you might load it faster and stuff like that as well but yeah it's uh it feels really well optimized it looks amazing um for the size of the game it's up there you know it's uh, in terms of some of the best looking games on ps4 and it runs really well i mean yeah on the standard ps4 it's only 30 fps you're never going to get 60 but it's never dropped a frame for me um and i think i think 30 fps is fine if it's consistent i think the reason why people kind of prefer 60 is because if you lose a frame or two at 60 you barely notice it you know if you drop from 60 you can probably drop as low as 55 and not really notice there's been a dip whereas if you're playing at 30 if you drop one frame you notice it straight away um so i think that's why people are a lot more antsy around 30 but i've not seen a single drop in my i don't know maybe a maybe 70 to 80 hours of playing so far um wow <laughs> and i've not noticed any dips or anything yet so it's yeah i'm pretty sure there aren't going to be any which is really good and really refreshing in in a console game so it's great that's, um that's pretty damn impressive i'm just having a look here it's uh, capcom's fastest selling game sold six million units yeah it's done wow. insanely well it's also uh surprisingly i believe it's doing best on xbox one which is surprising to me a because that's the first uh sort of platform microsoft is the first platform there's never been a monster hunter game on yeah Um, like it used to be on sony before it went nintendo so you think the big fan base would be there but it would appear it's xbox and again that surprises me because it's also you know coming to pc soon and a lot of xbox people also have pcs because they're just in the microsoft hemisphere kind of thing um 
but it seems that no one decided to wait who had an Xbox and a PC. They all just jumped on Xbox. Um, so, yeah, its biggest community is there, which I find odd, but that's not to say the PlayStation 1 is small or struggling or anything. It's, it's pretty massive. And because, I mean, yeah, like you said, biggest, fastest selling Capcom game. Yeah, it's, I guess it's uh, just, it's really riding on that being a water cooler type experience, right? You yeah, just, exactly. It, yeah, it's yeah. funny how much it does come up. Um, kind of just, you know, people at work and stuff who I didn't even really know played games and they're just like, oh, I've been playing Monster Hunter World kind of thing. And it's just, it seems like it's one of those things. It's almost like a, it's a, almost a fad rather than a game. You know, it transcends right. the gaming space to just become a general thing that everyone is talking about. Um which is really interesting for a game to be doing, um, especially a game that's not tied to any other product or IP or anything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I don't have a lot to say about the game. It's a Monster Hunter game. I've talked about Monster Hunter in the past when I played them on DS. You know, it's the same game. It's yep. just it looks better and is on a big screen for once instead of handheld, which is great because it means I can play it for longer, not get the hand cramps because I've got a proper controller. Um, but yeah, really get into that grind, that repetitive hunting monsters over and over again um but there's a lot of really cool shit in world it does look great i mean i shared a clip with you guys earlier just showing some you know cool stuff there's there's new moves and stuff which i mean maybe they've always been there but i've never used the hammer before so i didn't know you could fucking run up a wall and then backflip off it to land on a monster's back that's freaking awesome now it's the only move i do i'll try to lure things into walls just so i can run up and backflip off and everyone else in the group is going fucking keep it in one place i'm like no nice. no i can do this cool thing watch Very... we'll, get that, we'll get that clip up on the site so if you yeah. want to check it out uh, we'll, we'll make sure it's there for you nice one man uh, anything else you've been playing there uh, I've been playing the bayonetta remaster re-release what have you on switch yep. um which is good. I mean, I love Platinum Games, so obviously I was going to like it. This was potentially even their first game. Um, certainly their first game, I think, on their own, where they were themselves as Platinum Games, not, you know, working under another developer or publisher or anything. Um, and it holds up. It's interesting because it's not... I don't think it's digitally touched up or anything. I think it's literally just a port of the original game. Um, and... It holds up. Yeah, it looks looks good. It runs good. It, it's a solid 60 um, on Switch, which is incredible to think because there are people out there who would say, of course, like, how can you be surprised something would run at 60? You know, it's a game from 2006, 2007 or something, you know, 10 years old um, running on current hardware. But this was a PlayStation 3 game that struggled to get 30 that is now running at 60 on a handheld device that's insane that's incredible i can't the, the switch just continues to awe inspire at, at, like new ways all the time it's an incredible piece of hardware um and yeah bayonetta runs good on it and is a good game so if you like uh button bashy beat em ups it, it's withstood the test of time and if nice. you uh if you buy physically i think you can only buy two and then you get a digital download code for one but if you've gone purely digital like me um buying either one of them gives you a i think it's like a 72 percent or some really specific number discount on the other one in the e-shop um so yeah you don't get kind of the bundle of two and one, but you buy one, it discounts the other and still works out cheaper than buying it physically from EB. So Nice, nice, good pro tip there. Um, I just yeah. have one question before you move on from Bayonetta. I've, I've never played Bayonetta. I've always wanted to. Uh, I love Devil May Cry 1. Is it mm. is it going to cater to me? Is it that sort of combat and that sort of style? It is, yeah. It's... Um it's very very the same in terms of the combat you know it is very combo based and trying to get up it doesn't have that you know indicator on the corner of the screen going from c through to triple s super yeah, slam and stylish or whatever um yeah. they did without that <laughs> but it's still the same you know you want to go for the longer combos you want to mix up your weapons because at the end of every fight it gives you a rank um in this it's from stone to pure platinum um and <laughs> so you want to try and get the uh the best rank in every fight so that you can get the best rank at the end of the level and get the most rewards kind of thing um and it's the same cheesy over the top um sort of all the cinematics and stuff are just ludicrous spectacle displays of dispatching enemies kind of thing um yeah. so it's very original devil may cry um it's really i think the idea behind it was to make was to show 
Platinum was like, hey, you can make a game with a female protagonist and it's the same as a game with a male protagonist. You know, I think they very much, that game was kind of the, we want to prove that anything can be done with anything. And Bayonetta is 100% just female Dante, just as sleazy and irreputable as, as original Dante was. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's good. If you, liked, if you liked the old Devil May Cry games, yeah, definitely give Bayonetta a spin. And I believe even if you, you know, you, you're not sure if you want both, um, if you, I think the first, one, the first one's much cheaper than the second one anyway. Um, and like I said, then if you do like it, it unlocks the discount for the second one. Um, so for sure, I recommend picking up the first one. Um, though the first is a lot harder than the second I've heard. I've not played the second yet myself i've never played it was a wii u exclusive um and it was just one i never picked up on my wii u um but i've heard the second is better but easier so kind of the first i don't know you know it seems like a trial it's harder and not as good so it may turn you off but at the same time they are narrative games so jumping straight into the second might be a bit weird but you know it's your call all right awesome man uh mr harper what have you been uh what have you had your thumbs on man so two games really that i'll talk about one i already spoke about in the previous podcast uh, xenoblade chronicles 2 and i suppose i wanted to check in on this one again because it's it's a game that i'm going to be playing for a long time because i don't it seems that i don't get through games particularly quickly i'm not a fast gamer i tend to take my time with things and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a massive game, and I'm st- I'm still starting to understand the the scope of the game. It's it's mm. massive. It's huge. And I guess the, the the one thing I wanted to mention about this is this is the first game that I felt well that I've had to really research to even be able to progress in. And what I mean by that is uh, last time I spoke about how heavy all the, the the systems and things in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 are. It's a game about systems and, and understanding them and all this kind of stuff. And, and we we talked for a while about how there's all these battle mechanics and, and menus out the wazoo and all this kind of stuff. And I had to do a bit of research to actually really sort of understand how it all worked and how it all linked together and to feel competent with the game. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I kind of like that it's in depth enough that I had to do it. But at the same time, I think maybe the tutorials and things could have been a bit better. Right. So like I've got to the point now where I feel like I understand everything and I just need to do the work to kind of sit down and plan out how all the blades are going to work with their combos and things like that and just kind of put it into practice and, and, and use it. But at the same time, I'm getting to the point where I think like I need a little bit of a break. Like, do you guys ever get that with games where you've been playing them for, for quite a while and you think, oh, I just need to put this down for a bit just to give myself a bit of space? Oh, absolutely. Those sorts of dense games, especially. I mean, I don't play many of the, uh, you know, I'm intimidated quite easily, um, as everyone knows who's <laughs> been listening to this podcast, by uh, mechanics or, or pretty much anything. Text on screen um, turns me off. So, yeah, uh, if I encounter something, even The Witcher 3, you know, that took me two and a half years to finish that damn game. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> I, I definitely get I'm I'm a skittish I'm a skittish gamer for sure. Yeah, it's 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 essentially that, and I'm kind of just at the point where like I'm getting I've got all the characters down, I know who they are, and I kind of know where the story is is headed in a, in a way. And yeah, but just the amount of time I had to put into it, the effort I had to put into it to kind of get to this point, I'm kind of like I just need a bit of a bit of a break. So I'm gonna put that on the back burner for a bit, and I'll touch base. Um, once you know, once I pick it back up and, and and have some more time, but I'm I have found that after learning all the systems and things, it did become a lot more fun. Um, you just, just had to knowing. put in the work to read the yeah. user manual. <laughs> More or less, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that strategy read a few, <laughs> Yeah, read a few forums, understand what all the fucking text and bells and whistles and everything on the screen meant and did and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and it did become a lot more fun and easier because you, you can cause more damage and things in battle. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to give it a break. I'm going to give it a break and come back to it. Um, I hope that doesn't disappoint you too much, Balthazar, because I know this is a game that, that you really liked. Yeah, no, I um, I had to. I mean, I didn't play it all in one go either. I took uh, I took breaks from it. Um, I mean, not not long breaks. I still played it quite consistently through. But you know, I would take a week off here and there, kind of thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely, you've got to. 
you got to allow it to uh, i guess just you, you need to have fun with it um that's the biggest thing mm. especially with those huge games you need to make sure they don't become a chore because it's very easy for such a huge overwhelming game um to start to feel like a, a slog and a chore to get through it so yeah, yeah totally. absolutely i mean take a break if it's getting overwhelming step back for a bit come oh, back sweet. in and, I'm, yeah. I'm glad i have your blessing i appreciate that <laughs> the, the the other game i've been playing uh which i i kind of couldn't quite decide whether i was going to get it or not but i ended up getting it, it was kingdom come deliverance mm-hmm. which has been out for around a week or so yep maybe a little bit a little bit longer got it on pc and this is an interesting game this is obviously if you don't know much about kingdom become a deliverance it's it's a role-playing game and sort of i guess the style of something like skyrim or not necessarily the witcher i think the witcher is too far removed from it to to make a comparison there um but that first person kind of role-playing game in an open world except there's no magic and it's all historically accurate and and is aiming for realism is kind of i guess that's how you describe it and it's so far i've actually really enjoyed it it's it's i I was wondering whether or not the the absence of any kind of fantasy elements was going to make it just a bit dull and shit right like just a bit like oh i know there's nothing in these hiding in these bushes kind of thing but it's actually been fine like there's enough it's quite story driven and so there's enough there to to keep it quite well so far to for it to be quite engaging and also the characters are pretty cool as well okay um is, yeah, is so, it sort of is it based or is, is the combat i mean I, I might be jumping the gun here a bit when we talk about <laughs> the mechanics but uh my my the only thing i the only point of reference i really have of this is um that game called chivalry is it anything like that right. at all so to describe the combat mechanics uh, so you face a guy and you lock on to him yep. and it, it automatically locks on to the dude He's got a sword, you've got a sword, or whatever weapons you happen to be using. And in the middle of your screen, there is sort of a five-pointed sort of star icon kind of thing, and that shows the direction that you are holding your sword. So it's kind of like that game that came out a while ago, what was it called, with the samurai and the little battle arenas. Mm. You, uh, uh, oh. Sean, was uh, that? First person game. Well, we'll f- We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But anyway, and then you just, it's all about timing and, and blocking their for moves honor. and making sure you've got the for honor. Oh, that's for it. honor. That's oh, it. right. It, it's kind of like that and that directional sort of thing, but it feels, it just feels a little bit clunky, which leads me to my next point about this game in that everything feels a little bit clunky. Mm. And that's kind of the biggest thing that jumps out at you is, is it would be an amazing game if you could be really immersed in it but you can't quite get there because everything's just a little bit weird and and quite buggy and i know it's like the the warhorse games the guys who've built it this is their first game i think there was a kickstarter thing um and for and they're quite a small team so for that like it's an amazing achievement for for it being their first game but it is quite like it it's the sort of game that you probably to be honest want to ha- hold off on getting if it intrigues you and you haven't bought it yet maybe hang off until it's on a sale or at least there's kind of more word on the patching that they're going to do to to kind of fix up some of the bugginess because it, it it's there's a lot of potential there and i think it just needs a little bit more time for them to just just hone it and and really make it shine i suppose it's one of those kind of situations but the characters are really cool um the main character henry who you play is is just basically a lovable oaf and he's he's quite cool um and then you you sort of come across it's all about your relationship with the nobles and you get taken on this journey and you get caught up in a war that's that's going on so it's pretty cool um but i'm not entirely sold on it right at the moment maybe maybe wait for a sale if you're thinking about it but that's okay. all i've been playing that's me is it it's yeah. not an is it an early access at the moment regan or is it this a full game that's been released the, this is a full game it's a full yeah, game complete, okay. so yep the full release has happened and um the, the developers have been really good in that they're committed to you know they're quite vocal about their plans for patching it up and, yep. and adding well i don't know about adding content but you know definitely polishing the game giving some patches awesome which in is general. yeah exactly which is really awesome um and those people that have played it 
from what I've seen online are enjoying it, but it, it really is, it's that step up from being kind of just, you know, your middle tier game to being a good game is really just that fine tuning that they need to put into it. So I, I really hope they, they nail it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, um, I guess I'll, I'll talk about what I've been playing. I mean, uh, to be honest, not a huge amount until I arrived back and then I've just, it's just been a whirlwind of things. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I took my switch with me overseas and I had on the Shovel Knight and the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now, one of those games got a hell of a lot more playtime than the other solely because I didn't, I could, couldn't always guarantee I'd have a place to charge the switch. Um, and obviously one is a hell of a lot more processor intensive than the other one. Um, that mm. being, you know, Breath of the Wild can drain your battery pretty fast. Um, I got a more of a solid amount of um, hours out of out of Shovel Knight. So, yeah, I sunk my teeth into Shovel Knight a wee bit. Um, Balthazar, you talked about it on one of the podcasts you guys did uh, when mm-hmm. I was sort of AFK. It's it, I agree with most of what you said there, man. It's um, I've been waiting to play this for a long time. I've been waiting for sort of a platform in which or a good sale um, to, to sort of reel me in. Yeah, it's a very it's a very well made game. Um, it's got a sense of humour that I really dig as well. It's got quite tongue in cheek and sort of breaks the fourth wall at times and things like that. But it's just not really that thrilling to play as mm. a as a game. Um, I, I do quite like the sort of NES style that it has going for you know honouring those games of the past and things. But yeah, it's just I don't know. There's there's not much that pulls me back to old Shovel Knight, unfortunately. And it has a very strange menu sort of world map system where there's sort of four levels unlocked at one time. Most most of the time, you you know you'll move into a new world before four levels unlocked at any given time, and it doesn't really guide you to which one you should do next. And they actually go up quite significantly in difficulty. So you mm. can sort of get, you can unlock a batch of levels and jump into the hardest one without even realizing it, just because that one had the catchiest title or that one, you know, appealed to your to your sensibility. So you decided to say you jumped into something referencing the seaside. I'm like, okay, cool. I want to play a seaside level. And then it's just balls hard. Um, <laughs> and then you realize you have to go. Oh no, you should probably go go do those three levels prior to sort of. Um, work your way up to this level of difficulty so there are some definite issues i have i have with the game um at the moment i don't think i'm going to be finishing it eh? i have i have too much other good stuff that i'm playing and i don't really i don't really want to give that much time to shovel knight to be honest which is a shame because i have been waiting to play this for a long time and it's absolutely not a bad game let me just you know make that perfectly clear um but yeah not that not that drawn to it unfortunately old shovel knight Mm. Goodbye, Shovel Knight. I get this yeah. feeling that that might be the last we have to say on it. It, it <laughs> could not... be. I mean, I'll keep an eye on old... Um, I, I, you know, I referenced a book a wee while ago um, called... What was it called? Blood, Sweat and Pixels by Jason Schreier, the sort of insider stories from the gaming uh, journalism world. And they talk about the development of Shovel Knight from Yacht Club Games. And they seem like a great bunch of folks and they, you know, they went through a lot of trials and tribulations to get this game out, um, personal sacrifice and whatnot. So I have a lot of respect for them, and I'll definitely keep keep an eye on them, and and you know, purchase well, you know, potentially purchase what they what they put out there. I think they're doing good stuff, but um, yeah, this one maybe just not for me. I think um, maybe a sure. little bit too yeah. arcadey. I'm I'm sort of still struggling to to get my head around what it is that doesn't doesn't quite click. But um, yeah, not not quite for me, old shovel knight. Um, the next one I've been playing, which is. I was so gutted I couldn't play this before our Game of the Year awards. Uh, Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Mm. So I've, um, I smashed this out in probably like two two days, maybe, like a couple of good sessions. And wow, I uh, absolutely love this game. The story, as you mentioned, Balthazar, you know, you, you I think you had it nominated in a few of our categories for the OCG yeah. awards last year. Um, including best story and and uh, like best music or something like that. I can't remember, but um, yeah, the story is you know the New Order had a fantastic story. That was what that that was what everyone talked about with that game was how damn good the story was, and how no one saw it coming. No one no one saw that quality of story coming from a game like Wolfenstein, and Wolfenstein Two just kicks it up a notch. And the story is it goes into BJ's sort of past and it fleshes him out more as a character, which is hilarious because you think of this little dude who used to just be a 
you know a, a, a 200 by 200 pixel image in a in a, <laughs> in a you know pretty rough first person shooter. Oh, it was great for back in the day you look at it now wolfenstein 3d pretty rough first, first person shooter and now he is one of i would say one of the most interesting protagonists in all of gaming to be honest um very layered very interesting nuanced flawed character who just has you know a hell of a lot of growth throughout both the new order and the new colossus so um and a lot of nazis to kill too <laughs> which is always you know, something that anyone would struggle with yeah, so, yeah. i mean you yeah. butchered thousands of people in this game but again you never feel bad about it because they're bloody the worst people in the history of anything so you know who gives a shit um yeah just a fantastic game i i would struggle you know if i did a full review of this which isn't off the cards i would struggle to not give this 10 it would be border it'll be 9.5 to 10 i think it's very very close to a perfect game um, but yeah, absolutely fantastic, and some really cool places it takes things. Like I'm, I'm, I'm dancing around spoilers here, but some mm. stuff that I did did not see coming. Um, really interesting things in terms of the sort of split storylines um, that it gives that it sort of introduces in the new order. They they take that in some interesting directions, and uh, the guy who I played with, um, I can't actually remember his name. The younger fella who I saved. Uh, oh yeah initially uh has an awesome storyline in in the new colossus um to do with you know various uh, i mean it, it was in the e3 trailer there's like things to do with lsd quite a lot of sort of lsd stuff in there and uh, um, is that where it is because i never had any of that because i saved the old dude oh okay um, yeah yeah it's yeah. Um, it's in the young fellas young fellas storyline yeah, so it's definitely worth replaying for that stuff, man. That was one of my favourite parts of the entire game was him just sort of opening his third eye, as it were, and discovering all this crazy fractals and things. And I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. I've never seen that in a first-person shooter. So, yeah, Wolfenstein New Colossus, absolute must-buy, I would say. And I will also mention that I got this for eighteen dollars, so very happy with that. <laughs> Epic. Yep. Yep. Um, two more things I'll, I'll briefly mention. I played Rhyme. Um, Rhyme was one of the PlayStation Plus games for this month, I believe, and I've been looking forward to playing this for a long time as well. Uh, really, you know, just the sort of puzzle platforming, right up my alley, and it did not disappoint. I thought this game was fantastic. Um, Really, it's sort of imagine if you imagine the witness in third person with a soundtrack that sort of I don't know. It, it's absolutely devastating to be honest. The soundtrack it reminds me of Journey, and I actually had a chat with my friend about this, and um, yeah, it harks back to to games like Journey in terms of how just emotionally impactful this game is. It's again like Journey. It's a massive allegory for something else. Um, there's lots of metaphor and symbolism in there, and I won't won't delve into that because it's really cool unraveling what this game's actually about. Um, but there's some, the puzzles are very easy. I will say that they're like, I I, I would have liked them to be a bit more uh, intellectually you know challenging. Um, but I'm never against a game that's that just gets me through the story because that's a lot of what I look for in a video game is just the story in, in general because I'm a writer sort of thing. So that's what I focus on. So um, yeah, rhyme is rhyme is great. I would highly recommend if you're a puzzle platformer fiend like me. Um, very sort of sweet story and uh, just a really interesting art style. Just yeah, imagine the witness is a third person, and that's pretty much what it is, uh, without all the wank as well from the witness. <laughs> <laughs> sounds wank. <laughs> yeah, nice. sounds wank. Yeah. Uh, the final thing I've been playing, which this game is a long time coming. Uh, you know, it's pretty much the butt of all jokes concerning you know when the playstation 4 is is concerned uh knack now <laughs> knack <laughs> was another free game on playstation plus this month which is hence why i played it uh, i've finished this game now and it just wouldn't end now it's not <laughs> that's not to say it's a bad game because i did quite enjoy some things about it uh I, I there's some really cool animations and particle effects on display with knack which I think is pretty much... Because it was a PS4 release game, it's kind of just showing what the PS4 can do, I guess. It's just a tech demo, really, for the PlayStation 4. Um, so it's a feast for the eyes, but not very much more. 
It has a lot of very, very repetitive gameplay. Uh, Balthazar, you mentioned the contextual jumping, uh, mm. which is, yeah, I mean, you do the same thing. I won't beat around the bush. You do exactly the same thing every level. You go into an area or a chamber, you beat a bunch of dudes, and then you move on to the next area or chamber and maybe crack a crack a box and re- get some more um, <laughs> get some more health and then move on to the next. It sounds fucking boring if you <laughs> ask me. Um, it was definitely a bit of a slog. Uh, it shouldn't have been <laughs> ten hours. That's for damn sure. I mean, I suppose people want their money's worth for what they paid for Knack. But for me, just a PlayStation Plus game, I was expecting six hours five hours i would have been quite happy with that it kept going and the story (laughs) is one of the most bland and generic things i've ever had the you know displeasure of 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 sitting through it's sort of like pixar but made by students it's it's really bad it's just i can't even i couldn't even recite the story to you to be honest it's gone out of my mind but um picked up it made by students yeah it, it still sounds fucking awful it's yeah it's it, not great I, I i will also caveat all this with the fact that i played the game without sound and i was listening to podcasts while i was playing <laughs> so there's that as well so i never once heard any of the voice acting or the music all of the sound effects so <laughs> i can't really the voice acting that. was incredible yeah, uh, I'm yeah. assuming that is complete. For, for, you're being facetious there. Oh, I bet. Um, I bet Nick is voiced by Nolan North, and Nack is voiced by Troy Baker. <laughs> Nick and Nack, I didn't even realize that. Good God. I don't know if that's it either. I just choose to believe the inventor was called Nick, and he made Nack, and then the game was shit, and he didn't make any money off it, so he went and opened that little dairy, Nick Nack, in Wellington. <laughs> um very universal reference there i well the game yeah. when when you know when the credits finally rolled uh the game was written and directed by ps4 architect mark cerny so he's he was difficult i knew he was involved with knack but i always thought he was sort of an executive producer or something just some sort of uh you know filler credit but no he was he bloody directed and wrote this thing uh, you know the very soft-spoken PS4 architect that makes a makes an appearance and seems like a really lovely bloke to be honest, but he should probably just stick to making stick hardware. To, to be honest, at. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if Knack is anything to go by, and I will, you know, I'll say this now: I'll be playing Knack too if I can find it for a reasonable price, uh, or you know, if and when it comes onto PlayStation Plus. So, I'll be. Um, I'm, I'm, it's just another another reason for me to get through, you know, nine hours of podcast. I'm all for that. This actually this actually came up at work the other day. I sat next to a dude and he's like, he knows that we, you know, we talk about games and things. And he said, and he turned to me and he said, oh, are you, are you looking? Uh, I'm pretty sure his question was, are you looking forward to NAC 2? That's amazing. <laughs> and I, I sort of glanced sideways at him and just grinned. <laughs> Who and has ever on with said that in the history of, like, being completely serious about <laughs> It oh. was quite cute, actually. It was, yeah, it was endearing. And I just sort of chuckled and <laughs> carried on with my work. <laughs> <laughs> it just humoured him for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you yeah, know, if, if you like Knack, that's fine. That, that's absolutely, I, I have nothing against anyone liking anything. Um, you know, different strokes for different folks and all that. Uh, I just felt it was a pretty hollow experience. But, um, you know, I didn't expect a huge amount from Knack. And again, it had some cool animations, so... A feast for thine eyes, and not much more. So uh, that's that's all we've been playing. So we'll move on to the next segment here. Uh, Regan, back to you, mate. So we've done this before in a slightly different format, but we're mixing it up this time. We're doing movies in a minute, and <laughs> movies <laughs> being the operative word there. Yes, multiple plural, uh, and when I say we, I mean Abe, because. On Abe's journey across Europe, he uh, he also dabbled in quite a few, few movies. So we're sitting in the relatively difficult, well, extremely <laughs> difficult task, actually. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm keen to see how you get through this. Essentially, he's, he's going to give us a review for every single movie that he's watched in the last, what, four months? Uh, in under a minute. I, I actually, I, I sort of truncated this list somewhat. There were, There's 14 on there at the moment. 
if I put everything I've watched since we last did a podcast, there's probably more likely to be about 37. Um, I right, didn't okay, think cool. that was quite realistic, so I think I might <laughs> stick with 14. Okay. Abe, are you prepared? Are you mentally and physically prepared? I mean, I'm as prepared as I'll ever be after I take this drink of water. Okay. I'll allow you to take that drink of water. Um, All right. And and I'm going to give you a countdown. Here we go. I'm nervous for you. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi. So this is the uh, eighth entry into the Star Wars franchise. This is d- from director Ryan Johnson. Uh, liked it a lot. Fell asleep uh, once. Uh, and, yeah, I watched it at Edinburgh. Um, yeah, pro- way better than everyone's saying. And there was the green milk stuff came back. Uh, Paddington 2. So this is a lovely, you know, wholesome animated paddington film absolutely loved the first one close to being a 10 out of 10 this one not quite as good but it does feature a cameo from an irish wolfhound uh snoop lion reincarnated so this is a documentary on the rapper snoop dog um, 30 seconds oh shit so he went to jamaica and he um he became essentially uh, a new uh, lots of weed smoking uh, a stupid and futile jester this is a d- sort of docudrama on the rise and fall of uh oh, holy shit i can't remember their name uh, anyway moving on uh young offenders this is an irish an irish dark comedy absolutely loved it these guys go out and try and get a bunch of cocaine that was dumped in the sea. Uh, smart and, yeah, really, really sharp humour. Um, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Francis McDormand, absolute monster of a performance. In this movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was so much faster than I thought it was going to be. I got through one, oh, two, you, three, four, five, six of them. You vastly under, underestimated that. Grief. You, you started on Star Wars and you're oh. like 15 seconds into it. I was like, mate, you are, you are kidding. But anyway, carry on. I'll give you another minute. Okay. Okay. Thank you, man. Uh, so are we going straight away? Yep. Okay. Go. Three billboards outside of Missouri. Yeah. Absolute monster of a performance from Frances McDormand. Um, you know, previously known from Fargo and various Coen Brothers movies. She, uh, she is absolute standout, deserves the best actress nomination at the Oscars. Uh, this movie is about revenge and racism and various other things. Highly recommend. From Martin McDonough, the director of In Bruges. Now, Mother. This is Darren Aronofsky, uh, formerly of Noah, and uh, he was going to do a Batman movie, but that got canned. Anyway, Mother is sort of an allegory for, um, for various things, which I won't spoil. Has Jennifer Lawrence, uh, really good performance. Also has, uh, Anto- no, not Anto- yes, no, Javier Bardem. Uh, and a whole bunch of people will come into their house and they're not happy about it and things go tits up. Uh, the Meyerowitz, Meyerowitz Stories, this is by director Noah Bombach. Um, he sort of has movies that rule. He's sort of like Woody Allen. He has movies that revolve around intellectuals in New York. Uh, really good story. Has Adam Sandler doing his best performance in God knows how long. Um, and Ben Stiller's in it as well. And they, but yeah, both really good. Really interesting film. Very smart, Woody. Uh, it's the new It. That's a minute. Oh, my mate, God. Mate, you really need to sort this out. I'm just not even going to time the last bit here. You can just, you can just finish. I need, right? to, I need to cut it down to about three words a movie. Yeah, yeah, oh. genuinely. Yeah. All right. Never mind. Continue. All right, I'll continue. Uh, it, this is this is the new version of Stephen King's It. Uh, not as great as everyone was. You know, I saw people losing their absolute shit over this. I uh, enjoyed it, but it was... Uh, nothing to write home about really uh kingsman the golden circle sequel to the original kingsman movie directed by matthew vaughn this is also directed by matthew vaughn uh not as good as the first one though it does go some more gross places than the first one the first one had an anal sex joke this one takes things to another level uh ingrid goes west this has aubrey plaza from parks and recreation uh actually a really good movie although it made me squeamish due to the narcissism the level of narcissism in the movie and the sort of culture going around selfies and and um social image and things like that so yeah good movie but um disturbing undercurrent of uh sort of commentary there kim.com called in the web this is about the german fella who's living in new zealand to avoid being you know sanctioned by the fbi um and the sort of illegal wiretapping that jonky and the gcsb did on him uh, really good expose, actually. I really enjoyed this documentary. Very well made. And, yeah, felt a bit sorry for him. He seems like a really nice dude. But at the same time, he knew what he was doing, and it was more than illegal. Uh, a ghost story. This is a indie film uh, starring Casey Affleck under a sheet for most of the movie. There's a 10-minute scene of a lady eating a pie. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it also cycles through some uh, some time periods, uh, sort of thing that I didn't see coming there. Uh, final movie is Loving Vincent, which is a absolutely magnificent film it's the first ab- fully hand-painted film um there's been th- there was over 100 people working on this movie it's it's just an absolute sight to behold this film and it's it takes place after the death of the beloved artist uh vincent van gogh 
and it sort of goes into the relationships that he had with with people, you know, his close family and and people in his village and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's that's all my movies. That's all she wrote. Well I don't know why I'm clapping because you failed twice. I failed, but... twi- I failed spectacularly. <laughs> Not just once, but, but well twice. done. <laughs> Thank you. There's still still a lot of movies to get through. Um, I could talk about each you've... one of those films for about you know half an hour, so it was quite sure. hard to to abridge the rants on all of them <laughs> yeah pretty much all of them yeah mm-hmm. I'd, i if, if someone else had seen it i could i could wax lyrical on I any one of i couldn't talk about kingsman the golden circle for five minutes i don't think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. other than talking about in the number of ways it was just a complete rehash of the first one but taken <laughs> down a notch yeah, the crass level was turned up to a level was turned up but the the substance level it was just it was a copy paste except it was american rather than british therefore worse yeah no i agree i did it did have a lot of uh, american sensibilities coming into that one eh? um but anyway that's our that's our movies in a minute so uh, you know we might do that one again depending on how many movies i get through <laughs> Uh, or maybe just stick to two or three <laughs> instead, so I don't end up something you can, yeah, something achievable for you, man. Because that was <laughs> it was a disgrace. Was, you, were, you could say it, yeah, Regan, it was a was, disgrace. It was it was pathetic, pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we better we better move on to the uh, the final section of the podcast here. We got some news. We got a few news items to talk about here, boys. It's been the week or the fortnight of the remaster. Uh, you know, these things just don't stop coming, and love them or hate them, they're here to stay. So we've got Spyro remaster confirmed. Regan, you must be over oh, the Oh, man. Oh, man. The day that I heard about this, like, I mean, it's kind of, it's sort of, it, it feels like the reports have been, you know, decent enough to be confirmed, but not officially confirmed. So we're kind of hoping for an official confirmation. But man, it, you know, it's... It, I've talked about Spyro before, and uh, I nearly cried. I nearly cried. <laughs> um, it's it's going to be one of those boyhood dreams come true. Yeah, I just can't wait, man. I, I hope, like, I hope, I, I guess it's the, this way with all remasters that they do, but I hope it lives up to my memory of it, and it's not actually really shite now. Regan, does, but, um, does Spyro talk in the original games? Yes. He does. From memory? Huh. Yeah, I think he does, yeah. I see. Um, I have a problem with that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't think I can get on. He, he just seems like a, he seems like he should be a Gordon Freeman type where he just stays quiet. He was voiced right. by Elijah Wood. Oh, good gravy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, it, but I don't know. I thought it was fine. I don't remember ever real, feeling like the voice acting was a bad thing. Yeah. Um, what, so why don't, why don't you like the idea of it? Oh, I just think he'll end up sounding like Nancy Cartwright doing, you know, Bart Simpson or something like that. <laughs> and it's just all going to go tits up, but uh, you know, I'm right. open to it, but, um, I, in my head, cause I, I think I played Spyro, not, not a huge amount. Cause I was, I was, uh, Crash Bandicoot, you know, side of the camp, mm. but, um, I played it a little bit like demos and things like that. And I, I you know, I, I don't mind the idea of the NPCs being able to talk. What the hell's going on in the background? <laughs> not sure. Not it's sure. Rain. Might be I'm, I'm in a room with windows, and the rain is hitting the windows. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Fucking hard. It's intense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't mind the idea of the NPCs being able to talk, because I kind of vaguely remember a lot of them being, uh, you know, being like, like almost that Banjo-Kazooie style gibberish. But um, yeah, yeah. the idea of Spyro being like, I just need to go and get my gems. It just really doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. I, I, from memory, I don't think that that is kind of, you know, the take, the take that they went with it. Okay. Because he, he was kind of thrust into a situation that he, where he had to kind of solve it. He was the only dragon left, right? Like yes. all the other dragons got turned to crystal. Right. And so it was more of sort of like a, oh, I've got to, you know, I've got to go out and make, you know, sort out the other dragons and you know and, and it was it wasn't too bad he was but, still um, a child I, though he was very much here i come nasty nork that was how he spoke <laughs> Ooh, <it was>. <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get you and he always if made they, shitty flame based puns it, see if they I, i'm, I'm, fuck, I'm, I'm okay wait. with the puns it sounds so good i'm okay with the puns the puns are the puns take me back to a simpler time 
But, uh, you know, if they could re-record all his dialogue and maybe replace I'd be more into it. Mm. Well, we'll see, I guess. I hope they don't touch a thing. Because if they, <laughs> if they mess with Spyro, I'm fucking coming for them. They're messing with Regan Harper. All, all I want is, like, you know, a, a nice updated HD graphics, a better save system, and I'm happy. So no more uh, needing a memory card. Well, yeah, exactly, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, <laughs> cool, cool. Um, the other remaster that sort of emerged out of the ether actually a couple of days ago was the Burnout Paradise remaster is sort of been some, some promo images and things have been leaked and it's looking to launch on March the 16th. So I'm actually quite excited for this because I loved Burnout. Burnout 3 especially. Um, didn't play a huge amount of Revenge or Paradise, but Paradise was the one which took it sort of free roaming, I believe. Uh, and I adored Need for Speed, what was it, Hop, no, Underground 2, the one which, where, where, you know, was sort of the boy racer style thing, but it was also free roaming, and that was a great deal of fun. So if it's if it's something like that, if it's Burnout, but mixed with the free roaming of of, of that Need for Speed game, I'm all for that. I think that'd be awesome. Um, did mm. you, there, I mean, Regan, you're the racing, racing game guy. Did you play Burnout? Ne- Nah, I never did burn out. Nah, 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 nah I didn't. I, I, don't, I sort of did the need for speed thing, yeah. I suppose, and, and kind of missed the boat on burnout. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. I, sounds like fun. Nice. I, I just it, I just liked burnout because you could smash the crap out of other people and it made it a hell of a lot more interesting than just trying to race. Yeah, yeah. Because is burnout the one where it's kind of like almost all about the crashes? Yeah. That, that's, that, no, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That does sound fun. Yeah. yeah, that sounds great. They sort of yeah, they have like a weird kind of fascination with um, massive vehicle damage and and burnout. It almost gets pornographic to be honest. And um, <laughs> and a couple of the burnout, you know, big close crash zooms and things on tires and chassis becoming dismantled and things. Yeah, it's quite. They they go for the money shots. Let's say. Um, nice. Final final news item that dropped today actually was Soma, which I believe... Have we all played that? Me and Balthazar definitely have. Regan, have you played that? No, I didn't play it. I'm too much of a pansy. Yeah, it is pretty... Quite quite terrifying. But this might change your mind, mate. They've added a safe mode. So you can no longer be killed. What? Mm, I don't know if that's enough for me. (laughs) (laughs) If they they added like a... Yeah, like it's just a pansy mode where <laughs> it's not scary anymore, then that might be me. Well, the original Steam mod that this came from uh, before Frictional Games sort of took that idea and ran with it uh, was called Wuss Mode. So they, they, Wuss Mode. Yeah, right. Wuss Mode, yeah. Uh, probably not particularly... Uh, I mean, people have a problem with that, to be honest. People have a problem with bloody everything these days. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm into this because I loved Soma and I enjoyed it... I enjoyed the the terror of of having something chasing me and being able to hurt me. That that was all part of the game. But I also love it just as a just as an experience. Really, the horror comes a lot from the atmosphere than from the actual creatures. So I think the safe mode is actually quite a cool idea. Balthazar, you any thoughts on that? Um, I didn't die playing the game at all, okay. <laughs> so I don't get it. My right? I don't. Because I didn't die, my progress was never impeded by that. And the only thing that I guess I enjoyed was the thrill of the danger kind of thing. So if you remove that, there is no point in playing. Like, it's easy enough to finish without dying. So making it so you can't die, it's, it's doing nothing. I don't get... Yeah, I don't get it. I don't think it's good, but I... I mean, if there are people out there who would now play the game who wouldn't before, yeah. then it's good. Then I, I like that, and I think it's good because it, it was a really enjoyable game, and I think everyone who has the ability to should play it. Um, but it's not something I would ever use. You know, Even if I was looking to go back and do a 100% playthrough and collect everything, I still wouldn't use it because I, I never had any difficulty with it full stop. So it's it's an odd one. For safe mode to be not dying just seems strange. I would have thought it to be more something like, yeah, just replace the monsters with a giant black vertical censored bar that moves towards you or something <laughs> so that people like Regan can play it. That's fine. <laughs> just re- replace them all with candy canes or something. Um, yeah, yeah no, I, I'm, I'm quite interested in it because I specifically remember a few moments in Soma where 
you know, the, the whole idea with that then being, you know, this, this being a sort of spiritual successor to amnesia is that you can't look at the monster, right? Because you, if you look at the monster, uh, you start to go insane or, or you slowly build up an insanity, insanity meter or something like that. Is that correct? From They carried that over from amnesia, right? I don't recall, to be honest. I'm not 100% I'm on that pretty one. pretty sure they did. And I, I remember a few times, it's actually a really clever mechanic because, I mean, Balthazar, you've talked before about... Um, out, uh, no, Outlast two, uh, yeah. Well, no, out, was it Outlast two? Where, where Outlast there was various two, yeah. times where you just sort of cowered in a corner and looked at the wall, and you're like, if I can't see it, it's not there. Yeah. And, and this sort of takes that, me- takes that, and turns <laughs> it into a mechanic. Whereas if you don't look at the monster, um, you know, you, you're, you, you're not safe, but you're, you, you sort of don't go crazy. You don't impede your own progress. Um, and I remember specifically a few moments where I was just huddled in a corner, looking at the ground hoping this thing just didn't take a right turn and find me sort of thing. Um, and I definitely died a couple of times in, in Soma for sure, and it was terrifying. So, I mean, I'd, I'd play this a game again with safe mode on just because just I think the story is fantastic and the setting is unlike anything I've ever seen before. That that undersea section, like the deep, deep sea section is mm. insane. It's so good. Um, so, yeah, again, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm all for this, especially if it gets more people playing this um, this amazing game. So, Props to props to frictional for the, you know, for the good thought. Uh, that's all the news we've got. Any anything else you guys can think of that you want to talk about, or should we wrap things up? Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good as gold. Well, thank you for tuning in to the first episode of season three, the Overcast Gamer Show. Uh, as you know, per usual, all of our stuff can be found www.overcastgamer.com we've got the old RSS feed uh, which you know subscribe to that you'll get the podcast as soon as it comes out uh, you know in the next episode of the, of the podcast you're obviously listening to this one uh, we've also, we're also at facebook.com forward slash overcastgamer twitter.com forward slash overcastgamer and on twitch we'll be kicking back into those streams I think um, not too sure what we'll, we we don't have any plans as to what we're actually be doing but we will be kicking back into the, the streams uh, generally, that was Friday night, from what I remember, Thursday or Friday night. But we'll lock that down. We'll bang it on the old social media. We'll let you know what time we're streaming. And yeah, come and join in the fun and uh, come say hi. So twitch.tv forward slash Overcast Gamer NZ for that one. So thank you again for tuning in. Boys, any parting words? Uh, you know, just get out there and enjoy... Um look forward to Spyro I guess <laughs> get out there and enjoy life and look forward to Spyro yeah yeah life's good when Spyro's on the horizon so, you know, <laughs> I want to see that as a bumper I want, I want to see that on your car as a bumper sticker again <laughs> I'll just get it vivid and write it along the back window screen I'm sure your girlfriend will be stoked mm. with that yeah she'll love it she'll <laughs> love it yeah Balthazar any, any parting words there man no <laughs> in character as uh, as always there well thank you again for tuning in and we will catch you guys in a fortnight catch you later ciao yeah <laughs> <laughs>